I'm going to introduce our incredible first panelists. These are kind of absolute rock stars of corporate advocacy, um, people that I greatly admire and uh, really experts on how to lead the charge for criminal justice reform. Sheena Mead is the managing director of the Clean Slate Initiative. Uh, Heather Higginbottom is the president of the JP Morgan Chase Policy Center and leads corporate responsibility for them. And Matthias Stausberg is the group advocacy director at Virgin. So Matthias, can I pick on you first? Because um, we've been talking a lot, you and I, about um, about statements, about business statements and about commitments to change. Um, we know businesses are powerful change makers. What are businesses doing right now? And what, what kind of does the future hold? Uh, first of all, uh, Celia uh, and the Meaningful Business, thanks so much for having me. Really great to be here. Um, a lot has changed in, in the last couple of years. Um, I think we've moved uh, as businesses, uh, we've moved in a very different space now. Um, if you look at the last 10, 15, 20 years, um, a lot of businesses were primarily concerned with their own footprints, with corporate sustainability, with um, managing environmental and social impacts, um, essentially bringing their environmental, social and governance performance in order. Um, and a lot of businesses have made huge investments in that space, some of it driven by their own values and principles, I'd hope, um, some of it driven uh, by their own mistakes and failures in that space. And thankfully also um, uh, with, with you know, facing the pressure of NGOs, uh, civil society uh, at large, and sometimes regulators. Um, but I think there has been enormous progress. Does that mean we're at the end of the road as far as the sustainability journey is concerned? Absolutely not. Um, you know, there's so much that remains to be done, particularly on climate. Uh, but also on a lot of uh, social issues, diversity and inclusion, and so on and so forth. But something else has happened over the last couple of years, and I think that's really interesting and, and fascinating and compelling, and it's sort of driven me in, in, into this role that I have here at Virgin, and that is the idea that businesses must do more than just manage their own footprint, but actually become a voice for the greater good in society. Um, and I think a lot of that started maybe around five, six years ago, uh, businesses getting engaged, for instance, on marriage equality um, or, or businesses now um, taking a stand on criminal justice issues. Um, uh, but I think societal expectations have changed and mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of social contract, the license to operate that we gain as a business um, is shifting or is being redefined in a sense that um, our employees, our customers, everybody I think is now more than ever before expecting us to be a voice, to raise our voice, to use our networks, our influence, our leverage to be a driver of the common good, even if that common good is not seen as material to our business performance. And I think that's probably the most important part of this. Um, companies are beginning to take a stand on, on issues um, that by all accounts, are not necessarily um, at the heart of their business. Mm -hmm. Why are they doing it? Because they understand that um, they have a role to play in society, their leaders have a role to play in society, and as much influence as they and power they wield um, in their own interest through corporate lobbying, now is the time to shift some of that power to other issues and make a real difference. This is so true. And I think this is a really great time to bring you in to the conversation, Heather, because there's so much of what Matthias speaks about that um, comes right out of, you know, your company's kind of playbook and Jamie Dimon's philosophy and ethos and the influence that he's had over business membership organizations like, you know, uh, the business roundtable. And now I'd love to kind of take a minute to talk about those membership organizations because, you know, their business connected, they're influencers, but they don't have kind of customers in the same way as uh, as businesses like, like Virgin or JP Morgan. So like, tell us a little bit more about what's happening there and why you think that's happening. Thank you, Celia. And it's such an honor to be a part of this panel. I'm so pleased to, you invited me here today. I think I think everything that Matthias says is really spot on in terms of the evolution of the thinking and, and through all companies. I think for us at JP Morgan, um, perhaps our CEO has been really leaning in for some time, but 
um, as he was the, the head of the business roundtable for two years, these issues of what is the role of the corporation in society was something that was discussed and debated. Um, and it reflects a lot of what Matthias was saying is we do have a broader role to play. For us personally at JP Morgan, uh, one of the things that guys are thinking is we're only as strong as the communities we serve that we work in. And we're involved through our businesses, we're involved through our philanthropy, and in other ways with those communities. And when you start to understand the issues and think about the role you can play, it starts to open up a larger playing field and a different discussion. And so that's the way we have come to some of these issues. But I think for other member companies of, say, the Business Roundtable, the Chamber of Commerce in the U.S. is also exploring criminal justice reform right now. It's a similar journey. Um, it, you know, we know that in the United States, a one in three Americans has some sort of a criminal record. This touches everybody. It, it right. touches employees and customers. It has impacts on economic growth. It holds back progress in communities. And so if you're serious about wanting to play a part, then you have to be willing to take on not just the philanthropy, not just how do you address these issues uh, as a business, but through systemic change, through policy change. Um, and one of the things that's been unique about the way we've approached this at JP Morgan is through what I lead is a, is a full policy function that is dedicated to this suite of issues um, that isn't directly a bottom line or a, a bank issue in the sense that you might think with traditional corporate lobbying. This is about how do we engage with other stakeholders and partners, businesses, nonprofits, organizations like the one Sheena runs um, to say we want to be part of the solution, we want to use our platform, we want to use our voice, and we want to bring others along. And it's encouraging that we have been able to develop this capacity. But what's even more encouraging is that I think more and more companies are saying, that's a really interesting way to approach some of these issues. How are you doing that? And how can we work together? And sometimes that's through a membership organization. And sometimes it's individual, individual companies and where their interests lie. And I think having the opportunity to engage through a membership organization to identify companies that are really interested in stepping forward is also a huge asset. When you have a 200 person uh, business membership organization or larger, it's gonna be hard to find things that every single company agrees on, but it's not gonna be hard to find issues that 10 or 15 or 20, you know, multitudes, orders of magnitude. And those are the kinds of conversations that we're having. I, I just before this panel was, was on a meeting that our CEO is hosting with several other CEOs uh, talking about the role that banks can play in driving and reducing the racial wealth gap in the United States, right? Like that's a really important conversation to have in that membership organization. I think we're really exploring the spaces that we can show up in and how we do it. So incredible. I think, you know, there's so many things that, that you and Matthias share and your organizations share. And I think that kind of commitment to collaborating and learning and making sure that your decisions are well informed. And then that notion of kind of putting putting what you have out on the table and kind of saying to the campaign community like what will be most helpful for you and and we'll do our best to give that give that help to you and i know we've spoken to before about kind of you know you one of the things i love about the way you speak heather is you're so frank you say like jv morgan's the biggest bank in america we get into rooms and we have conversations that we know that our campaigners and your average citizen doesn't have. And so we see that as a responsibility to kind of use that. And I'm going to say the word power. I think the word power is kind of a dirty word in the business community right now. But you know, if you have it, use it for good, right? And Sheena, I think no conversation about power and the analysis of power and picking up on some of what Heather spoke about, about, you know, changing systems injustice um, is really complete without bringing you into it. You know, you're an advocate, you're a campaigner. Um, from your perspective, you know, what impact do you think businesses can and should be having on this movement? Um, and, and, and maybe as a second question, how has COVID kind of changed that? Yeah. Well, one, thank you for having me today, Cecilia. I just want to say as an advocate, as a campaigner, and as someone who is closely, um, has an experience to, you know, to this issue of injustice, uh, 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 criminal justice issues here in America, I think it's really inspiring and hopeful that organizations uh, like Responsible Business Initiative for Justice is hosting uh, an event like this to have this type of conversation and engage in other businesses and bring them along. Um, you know, at, at, in America, most of the businesses start right in the communities. They start off as small uh, 
uh, mom and pops is what we call it in the U.S. Uh, businesses. And the people that patronize them are their neighbors, the people they go to church with, the people they, they, their kids go to football games with or play uh, games with or in school with. And I think the impact, um, the, the businesses are understanding that the people who are being impacted by these different injustices and, and, and things in the communities are being impacted by their, their, their neighbors, their family members. And so right now, I think businesses could take action by not being silent. I think one of the other panelists talked about not being silent. You know, I just want to give an example of like the NBA. The NBA is a business. I know it's a sports, uh, a sports, uh, sports organization. But at the end of the day, they make revenue by engaging their audience, engaging, um, sponsoring, doing sponsor ads, engaging um, viewers. And the NBA did something um, recently when there were some more police killings that happened after George Floyd, and they refused to go out on the court. It was a small step. It was a small action but it actually led to big conversations, right? Some people thought it wasn't enough. They thought that they should stay maybe in protest. But the thing is, they had a conversation with their leadership in the business and said, look, we cannot stand for this. These are our communities. These are the people that we love. These are our fans. And that conversation actually opened a door, right, for arenas all across the country to be early voting sites in America where voter suppression is an issue right now. You know, them having that conversation, them branding their, their field, their, uh, the stadium of Black Lives Matter is actually just starting a conversation for people who may not know, you know, what this means to like black communities and brown communities, because to be honest, a lot of these conversations are not really happening at people's dinner tables. A lot of people are being really mute to it, or they don't know how they fit in. They're like, That's, this is not about me. And I think right now businesses are seeing that they can have impact, uh, you know, by just in, engaging or at least bringing people to the table to learn. That, yeah. you know, the community, you just want to know that people are willing to learn. Just don't shy away from the issue. And I think when you go, like, to COVID, you know, natural disasters, you know, I live in Florida uh, in the U.S., and we have hurricanes. And anytime we see a natural disaster, what do we see? We see people come together in crisis, right? Natural disasters, mass shootings. Our communities come together no matter – if, you know, political size or whatsoever. And COVID has done the same thing. Our communities are advocating that our businesses could stay in, um, in, in business and they could rise above the water, but also the community is seeing that the people care about them and that they have to care about the people as well. And I think because of COVID, it has been less uh, distraction and noise to a lot of the issues because they're shut down and they realize they have to, they have to appease to the base, to their customers, and they can't stay silent. Sheena, can I stay with you for, for a few yeah. more minutes and spring a question on you? Because I don't think there's a soul in the world right now that doesn't know a little bit about what's going on with, with voting in, in, in the state of Florida. And you mentioned your personal connection. And it would be great if you could just share a little bit about, about that personal connection and tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the story of, of what you're seeing in Florida right now. Yeah, so right now in Florida, uh, for folks who don't know, you know, um, in, in Florida, there was a, a law that has been in our Constitution since the freeing of slaves that happened over 200 years ago, that if you had a felony conviction, that you were banned for life from voting. And just for folks to give folks a little bit of context on what you could get a felony conviction for in the state of Florida, you could get a, a felony conviction for driving on a suspended license, catching a lobster with a short a tail too short, um, by, uh, burning tires in public, there are many laws that was created to disenfranchise people. So overall, there was 1.4 million people disenfranchised. In 2018, the organization Florida Rights Restoration Coalition passed a constitutional amendment that was the largest expansion of voting rights since the women's suffrage movement. And since then, there has been an attack on, um, you know, this expansion of democracy where they are requiring people to pay fines and fees. This is when the like businesses actually stepped up, right? Ben and Jerry's. Who would ever thought that a, a, a ice cream, a national ice cream corporation, would get behind second chances and says this is important to our, this is important to our base, this is important to our business, this is important to our franchisees, and they stepped up and they had signs in all the ice cream parlors. They collected petitions for this to get passed. They're they're still engaging. Uh, 
And right now, you know, an election is coming up where there's 700,000 people who don't know if they'll be able to vote. And they recently, uh, the organization raised uh, over $20 million to pay off folks fines and fees. And so, you know, I, I, I think we're at a point in, in history where, which, you know, people are watching where businesses are taking a stance at, what side of history they're going to be on. Are you being silent? Are you being engaged? Are you helping us? At the end of the day, we're in a pivotal point in history across the world. And what your, the people who patronize the businesses, they want to know where do you stand on these issues? Where are you investing your money? Are you investing in private prisons? Are you investing in things that is continuing to like oppress their communities? And I think this is a, a really a moment in history where people would just do some internal looking into their businesses practice. Like, I think that is a long way for activists and campaigners to know that your lease taking a look. And that's why we love Chase so much because they've taken a moment to say, what are we doing that we could be helpful? We can't change the world overnight, but we could take a small action step. There's so much to unpack from what you said, Gina, and as, as always, just sort of bang on. You know, you mentioned mom and pop shops and, and, the, and, they, and the role that they play. You know, um, there was a, a, a campaign um, that we worked on in Ohio uh, that, that that kind of came to end of phase one last week where we work largely with, with smaller manufacturing facilities and they raised their voice in the state of Ohio and they called for an end to juvenile life without parole and they were successful in, um, in moving the needle. And the result was that, that a bill that was sort of widely worried about to move through the Senate moved through the Senate with, with a lot of support and is now, you know, heading for the House. And, and the result of this bill, if it's successful, is we will no longer incarcerate children to die in prison. Like, mm. I have been in this work for a really long time, and I still feel like the tingles when I say that, right? Um, so, so I think that, you, you know, one of the things you're saying that resonates so much with me is like, there's no particular identity for a business, you know, from, from the Virgins and, and the JP Morgans to the manufacturing facilities in Columbus, Ohio, like you have a role, a role to play. And there was this other part of what you said about the sort of internal and external components of what businesses can do. And continuing to reflect a little bit on Ohio, one of the things that really united all of those businesses that stepped up um, uh, in, locally in Ohio was, um, they'd done the work internally. Nearly all of them were um, businesses that hired, promoted, and really were committed to having a workforce that included people who had a, had direct experience with the criminal justice system. And that meant that when they spoke, they spoke with authenticity and humility and because they knew, because they knew, you know, Ray Shunt on the, on the, on the factory floor, who was a line supervisor who'd been, you know, who'd been sent to prison at, as a child and had personal experience of this. Um, we've had some amazing questions from, um, from the people that are joining us. And I'm gonna kind of reflect on one of those now. Um, uh, a lot of people are kind of uh, looking to the future um, and, and lifting the lid on um, what's happened in the justice system has really horrified a lot of people. Um, you know, Heather, I'd love to talk to you about some of the places that JP Morgan is really working on solutions. And Sheena, I'd love to bring you into this conversation too. Hey, Celia, you know, just a couple things I want to mention reflecting on Sheena's comments. Yeah. Um, just the, the idea that a business um, speaks out on an issue, gets engaged in an issue, um, you don't know all the different ways in which that's going to have, uh, the way it's going to show up. So two yeah. weeks ago, one of a, a very large client of ours, I got connected with because he wanted to raise money for the Florida Rights Rest Restoration Coalition to pay off fines and fees. And he said, well, my bank is involved in this issue. Maybe they can help me make some connections to raise these resources, et cetera. And it's just, I just mentioned that because the role that you can play as a business in, in these issues or others that are touching people's lives in important ways, you, you, you can go in and you can have a strategy, an advocacy strategy. We have a hiring strategy. We are working with others. But there are so many knock-on effects that I think are also important. And that, you know, in this case, we made a client happy. That was my motivation. Of course, my motivation was helping him to get connected with the right folks. But the point is, you don't know the different ways that, that, that you're going to see the business community show up. And it's kind of exciting to see how these connections can get made. And the point I wanted to make about that is, in solving these problems, 
these challenges in the criminal justice system and some of the other issues we have around um, racial equity, uh, everybody has a role to play. The business community has a role to play. The government has a role to play. Advocacy organizations, we all have to come together to solve these problems because what we've seen is that when we haven't come together, not only have the problems not been solved, they've, they've gotten so much worse. We were talking about COVID earlier. Um, every time there has been an economic disaster in the United States, we have recovered from it. And every single time communities of color have been left worse off than they were before. So the rest of the country, growth continues, we're all fine and good, but, but it's leaving these communities further and further behind. We have to use this moment to say that's not acceptable. And as we come out of COVID, as we deal with the racial reckoning after George Floyd's murder, we've got to come together and address these problems. And you don't know different ways in which that's going to affect your business. And it's exciting to think in those terms. I think when that's we, so true. Sorry, sorry, no, uh, Heather, no. I was going to say, I think that's so true. Like, we put together this toolkit that we, we, we were sort of responding to this, like, where do we start question that we were getting a lot from businesses. And even though it's like our entire work to work with businesses and to get them engaged, we still found ourselves going to the examples of what businesses had done and then pulling them into categories rather than starting with the theory and then looking at ways that it, that it had played out in practice. And maybe one of my team can put a link to that toolkit, but we really kind of like, we started with all these examples. You guys are on that, you know, of, of ways that business had been involved and then realized that they were kind of kind of collecting around various different different buckets mm -hmm. but i think that's so true and i hope and i think that you know next year we'll rewrite we'll revise the toolkit and there'll probably be like mm -hmm. five extra ways that we can see that businesses could be engaged because we learn and evolve and crucially we innovate and i think that's right. uh, the justice reform movement needs that innovation and, and businesses bring innovation and that kind of innovative energy in a way that's really, really welcome. So thank you so much for raising that. Sorry, Heather, I know you had a, no, a little bit more to say. I was, well, I thought I should actually answer your question. So when we think about the future and the issues that we're working on, you know, when we started this work a little over, or just under a year ago with the formally launching our campaign, we were really looking through the lens of, um, as an employer, how do, how do we address um, second chance hiring, let's call it. And we had a plan for our own hiring. We've, we have um, hired 1,000, 10% of our new hires last year in 2019 were people who had some kind of a criminal record. And that's for a very highly regulated financial institution in the United States. But our HR professionals said, okay, we know we've banned the box on the initial application for employment. We know how to do some things, but if we really want to take this to the next step, we need to do things differently. And we started a program in Chicago, um, working with community organizations and helping people understand what roles they could qualify for within JP Morgan, um, what paperwork they needed, um, how to approach that process. And it's been uh, a learning experience for us. And the intention is then to say, this is what we've learned in this market. And we're going to go to another market where we do different types of hiring and replicate that. That was really important for us because it, it was about our own firm and diversifying our hiring. And one of the things that we found in engaging with other businesses who were also interested in doing this type of hiring is that there's a vacuum of information and knowledge about mm -hmm. the issues and the complexities. And so one of the things that we've been working on and hopefully we'll be able to, to stand up soon is a, is a, is a coalition, is essentially a table where businesses can come together and share best practices, hear from experts, and really demystify some of the challenges around uh, hiring people who have had, who have a criminal record or background that has implications for um, where they work. And, and what we found is even just toolkits, basic information, conversations, dialogue, really can go a long way. So again, that was something that we said, oh, we should do this because we started down this path and we hear from other businesses that they have the same questions. So it's not exactly the most innovative proposal in the world, but it was learning and it's that's how we go forward. And then through our advocacy, we're very focused on, on issues that, that are you know, really significant barriers to employment for people who were either incarcerated or have a criminal record. And um, you know, some of the, the work that we're most excited about is around the Clean Slate Initiative and around automatic record clearing. I'm sure Sheena will talk about it, so I won't go into detail, but I thought I'd just provide one more vignette um, from sort of business perspective. So in the state of Delaware, J.P. Morgan Chase is a large employer, and there is an initiative, uh, a, a state legislator there who is drafting legislation uh, to have automatic record clearing. And he attempted this before. There were some challenges. We sat down with him, um, not just with our corporate responsibility hat on, but with our business leader 
the second largest employer in the state, and said, we believe in th these policy changes. You can see it on our website. We're, we're very dedicated to this. How can we support you so that we can build political support, we can bring the business community along, and maybe get over some of the hurdles that you encountered in the last session? And it was, you know, we, we, we had to hit the pause button because of COVID and a lot of other issues that the state legislature is grappling with. But that's going to pick back up. And our market leader had engaged the Chamber of Commerce, the banking community in Delaware, many of the other business contacts he had to come together to brief on the issue, to explain why this was important to J.P. Morgan Chase, to have substantive experts be able to explain the system as complex as it, as it is for a lot of folks who had never, you know, been involved in these sets of issues before. In a very short period of time, we had lined up a lot of support. And I think that's a conversation. It would have been very difficult for a non-business leader to have convened and to have engaged on. And it's just one example of the types of issues that um, when you, you have the right approach and you're willing to use some political capital and influence, you really can move the needle. And one of the, the last thing I'll say is one of the critical linkages for us has been staying very closely connected to the nonprofit and advocacy community leading the work on this so that we know where our, our engagement can be effective. Where do we need some of that? And we were involved in a similar effort in Michigan to be supportive where they needed help and also saw some results there. So I just thought it would be useful to break down a couple of very concrete examples where we've been able to come in and work with partners and bring the business community along. That is so helpful. Thank you, Heather. I think that those concrete examples, you know, in your work in, in Michigan is yielding change like you know I think that it's often very hard in the work that we all four of us do to see where impact results in change but I think you know you can see it um, and, and the reason why we can see it is because exactly as you said like it's kind of all the pieces moving together you know when I think about Ohio for example like did the businesses carry the day? No, there was tons of work done behind the scenes. Would businesses have been able to, to make that happen on their own? Definitely not. Like there are critical voices and players and stakeholders at the table. Were they absolutely essential in the kind of, as a piece of all of the pie? Definitely, definitely. And I think, uh, Sheena, let's talk a little bit about Clean Slate because I think this is something that you know, we, we know the vernacular of and like the concept of automating expungement is, um, is sort of two technical words that I don't know if they really make total sense. So pull it apart, tell us the nuts and bolts of, of how yeah. crazy this is and what we're going to do to, to try and change it as just one great example of how things change, you know? Yes. I'm so excited to talk about the solutions that we're working on. When you're dealing with the issue, issues that are part of our brokering criminal justice system, it, it, it seems so monstrous. So it, it could get a little discouraging at times if you think that you could like, uh, attack it all at once but there's so many like you said there's everyone has a role and everyone has to find a lane and so with the clean slate initiative before i talk about the solution i think it's really important for folks to understand what the problem is especially folks who are not in america so few quick facts just to know that nationwide between 70 million to 100 million americans have some type of criminal record right and and, and going back to what heather said that's one in three americans and I just need folks to understand that a criminal record does not mean that it led to a conviction. Sometimes uh, people could have got arrested. I mean, even some of us in our young wild days could be hanging out, jumping a fence, partying too much. You know, uh, I think about Woodstock. I don't know much about that life, but some of our grandparents at home, you know, I don't want to step on toes, had so fun back then. But even during those times, an arrest, if it did not lead to a conviction, it will still pull up on your record. So what does that mean for people here in America? That means that it could lead to a lifetime of poverty. It could lead to um, you not being able to apply for, for college. You have to check the box when you uh, go to get higher education. Can you imagine trying to get back on your feet from something you did years ago? You've been a contributing a member of society, a, a taxpayer, but yet a conviction in, uh, or arrest is creating a barrier that you can't get uh, safety net benefits, you cannot get uh, access to higher education. You can't be, uh, 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 what is it? Um, when you go to your children's uh, trips at school, I got five kids, it should come off really easy for me. But a volunteer at your kid's school, these are different barriers, you know, uh, and access to jobs right now in COVID. People are out the job market right now and they're trying to come back in the job market, right? To get an economy back together, but they have to check the box. And if you have to say, hey, I've been arrested, 
Who is the employer really going to look at? Are they going to put more time on your application or someone else? So the Clean Slate Initiative is working to make sure that we can automate this process of petitioning, you know, uh, in your state to get a record clearance. So in America, you have to ask for permission. You have to ask for forgiveness. You have to go through this tedious process, get all your paperwork, go to uh, a board or however it is in your state and petition them to ex like seal and expunge your record to say, look, I've done my time. Please stop letting this thing pop up. And so what we're doing is automating, meaning that when you've done your time, you've, you know, you've been out, you've been out living a clean, a clean slate, that this is not going to, uh, you don't have to go back to the courts. You don't have to petition the courts. You don't have to petition you know, uh, the, the court system to clear you off your record. And we've seen success in Pennsylvania. I think they had over 30 million cases still. Um, Utah uh, passed clean slate uh, legislation that was really passed with a lot of uh, business partners. Uh, the chamber was really heavily involved there because they saw the economic value to being able to give people a second chance to the business base. And then most recently, we were excited about last week, Michigan passed clean slate uh, expungement package, uh, packages and bills, which actually involve felony convictions, right? Millions of, of Americans are actually on the pathway to having a clean slate and be able to make it easier for them to re-engage in society and get back on their feet. And this is what we're doing at Clean Slate. And we're looking to work in, you know, more states across the country. And I'm really hopeful that in years to come, that we'll start looking at what we could do on a federal level. And we can't do it alone. We have to do this in a bipartisan way, right? Making sure that all people across the aisles are coming together because this is not a political issue. This is not a Democrat, independent, or Republican issue. This is an American issue. And at the heart of it is about we're a country that believes in second chances. And people should not have to live a lifetime of poverty. It takes business communities, people who are directly impacted. It takes all of us to make sure that we can pass these type of reforms across the country. So I'm really excited about being at the helm of this. Um, this movement because myself, I'm directly impacted. You know, I'm someone who had a blemish record. And I remember, you know, after I was being a, a single mother of five children, when I wanted to go back to college, and I can even remember the rest that, that we were talking about. It was a simple bounce check for $75 that was on my record that I had to do, uh, do 24 hours of time on. And these are the things that are holding people back from advancing uh, in the communities. So I'm excited about leading this with purpose and passion and making sure that these policies get passed across the country. Thank you, Sheena. Matthias, I'd love to come back to you for about four minutes on um, talking about what you guys are doing at Virgin because we've heard from um, Heather, you know, speaking about very internal and external approach, primarily focused around workforce um, as a kind of ident identifying feature of their engagement, um, primarily in, in the US. And Virgin's taken a really different approach and has, um, you know, other kind of uh, uh, areas that it's working on and issues that it's working on. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you guys came to that, what you guys are doing, and uh, the work that you're up to, Matthias. Um, I, I'll try and sort of <laughs> In a few minutes. First of all, let me say though, I'm, I'm, I think a lot of people, a lot of us that are outside the U.S. Um, uh, have no idea just how much work and effort goes into um, the work that Sheena does and her organization does. Uh, it's so it's so enormous and so significant, um, and you face so much adversity along the way. Um, so that I have nothing but respect for that, and I hope more businesses. Um, will come on board with this because it is one of the defining issues right now, sort of threatening to break the social fabric of the U.S. apart, and, and something needs to be done about it. Um, well, for Virgin, you know, this has been a long journey, a 50-year journey, if you will. Um, you know, we're, we're privileged and and uh, 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 fortunate to have a very charismatic founder um, who's been outspoken for the entire duration of his business career um, and has taken on a lot of different issues um, over time. Um, rather than just walking through them, I just wanted to share maybe three or four takeaways that may be of use to the audience that I think um, are important for businesses to, to understand when it comes to engaging on advocacy. The first one is smart partnering um, and understanding that you as a business or we as a business don't know it all. In fact, we don't know anything really. 
Um, so on the issues, the multitude of issues that we've looked at over the last couple of years, the refugee crisis, ending the death penalty around the world, um, trying to move the needle on criminal justice, ending mass incarceration, um, fair chance hiring, uh, wildlife conservation, ending the poaching crisis um, or, or ocean conservation on this sort of multitude of different issues. Um, you quickly get to a point where you realize you have to approach this with humility and you have to build relationships of trust with the organizations that really know what they're doing. And it's all about empowering them and giving them the support that they need so they can succeed on their mission, which is also then our mission because we share the same values. Um, but it's them that often do all the heavy lifting. We can just sort of provide support through our voice, through our resources and networks. So that's one important point. The second one is don't do it for your brand, do it for your values. Um, and, and I think that's where a lot of businesses fall short, right? Uh, looking for quick wins. Um, but you know, the COVID crisis has shown us one thing and that is um, we're not just people that go to work and check everything at the door. Um, we're parents, we're carers, we're um, you know, uh, 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 patients, you know, we, we have all sorts of complex relationships um, and, and we're beginning to realize that you know, the, our values and our principles form the business that we're part of. Um, so it really, whatever you do needs to be aligned, aligned with the principles and values and it should be values driven, not brand driven. The third point, and this goes back to something that Sheena said earlier is um, make sure you don't undermine your good advocacy with unsustainable and harmful business practices. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are lots of examples of that. So companies going out there, you know, using their voice, speaking up on issues, and then at the same time you realize their business practices are part of the problem. So the strategies need to be aligned here between what you're doing to minimize negative impacts as a business and the voice that you project on the outside world. And the last point, um, I'm trying to actually read my own notes here. Um, I failed to read my own notes here. <laughs> but, um, well, you had a whole lot of great points. I'm here just I clapping and, and snapping. I'm like, I think those are, you know, those, those are sort of important takeaways um, that that every business should adhere to, you know. And we're not, we're not, you know, we're not operating in isolation. Um, we're important players in society. We have a voice. Oh yeah, and this is the fourth point actually. It's not just about the big megaphone, right? It's not just about the businesses going out there and shouting out about a cause. It's also about leveraging other capacities and resources that you have. Um, so on human rights issues, for instance, we engage in a lot of quiet diplomacy on the death penalty as well, um, you know, using very specific channels and routes of access that we have to make a difference. Or it's about providing the kind of material support at times to an organization that is really in the best position to drive change. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a multifaceted strategy. Advocacy is not just about shouting out. I think that there's probably no better way to close out this than those amazing words, Matthias. Um, thank you so much um, for everything. To Sheena, Heather, Matthias, it's been amazing. Mm -hmm.